Good morning, Austin. Welcome to our virtual press conference on Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month. I'm Officer Kevin Kurzan with the Austin Police Department Public Information Office, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Spanish interpretation of this media is available on ATXN3. <clears throat> Human trafficking involves the use of force, fraud, or coercion in exchange for labor, services, or a commercial sex act. Texas has the second highest number of trafficking cases in the country. This collaboration aims to inform and educate residents and city employees on how to recognize the signs and report human and labor trafficking to law enforcement. To start, Sergeant Mike Spear with the APD Human Trafficking Unit will first say a few words, followed by Holly Christine Hayes, who's the founder and CEO of Sanctuary Project. After Holly, we will have Erica Schmidt-Portnoy, who is the Senior Program Director for Refugee Services of Texas. After Erica, Ms. Monica Charles will be joining us to share a personal story of human trafficking. After Monica, we will have Allison Franklin, who is the director of the CARES program at the SAFE Alliance. She will share some words. And then we will have, finally have Tiffany Lee, who is the partnership manager with Allies Against Slavery. After we conclude with our speakers, we will open up to our pool reporter who will ask questions from the media. Sergeant Spear, I'll pass it over to you. Hello, I'm Sergeant Mike Spear with the Austin Police Department Human Trafficking Unit. I supervise um, 15 detectives who are, whose duties include human trafficking, uh, child exploitation, um, gambling, and prostitution. Um, our, our priorities for the unit are human trafficking and child exploitation. Um, I guess to start with, a lot of people aren't aware that human trafficking does exist in Austin and is very prevalent. Um, it's not always the the uh, people bringing in crates of women from another country or laborers from another country, which does happen. But the majority of cases that we work are um, usually teenage girls, teenage runaways, um, basically victimized by traffickers and groomed to uh, to get them to think that they are almost they're, actually their boyfriends and and um, and either forcing them or talking them into uh, being sex trafficked. Um, my unit is currently works an average of 400 human trafficking cases a year and that's that 15 detectives working those along with their other caseload of child exploitation, prostitution and gambling cases and, and all of these, cases that, that I'm explaining are um, as they apply to organized crime. It's not going to be a street level prostitution cases or, or trafficking cases. Um, it's, it's all investigated as a uh, large organized crime investigation. Um, some as uh, I've been with Austin Police Department 28 years and I'm fairly new to the trafficking investigations arena um, and my detectives may be more more qualified to speak on this, but all of them work in an undercover capacity in some form or way. So I, I would prefer they not be on the news. So um, forgive me if it takes me a while to answer questions or anything like that. Um, so I'd like to talk about some signs of trafficking and um, they can take, it's very hard to spot if you see trafficking. Uh, victims are not, they're often isolated. So you, you might, see them being isolated or controlled and scared to interact with strangers and uh, they don't have basic needs met. So if, if uh, you see someone that's that looks hungry, maybe abused with uh, bruises, um, a big sign is, is that if they don't have control of their own cell phone or their own phone or they don't have control of their own identification and that's a, a, a big way that these traffickers will control them. They can't leave without an ID or a passport and they can't reach out for help without their phone. Um, I would say, um, again, that, that the majority of cases we take are the exploitation of teenage girls, and, and they're usually uh, runaways, and we've come to notice that the more times a uh, person has been listed as a runaway or recovered as a runaway, the more likely they are to be victims of trafficking. Um, and the common victims of human trafficking it's hard to it's hard to tell i mean there's no there's no really commonality with victims 
um, but the majority, or predominantly, again, teenage girls who have run away from home and don't have a safe home to go to. A lot of times there are victims of abuse at the home, at their home, and run away from that, and then are um, prime uh, victims for trafficking. Um, as far as perpetrators go, it's also hard to find, to tell them. Um, just like the victims, traffickers are, come from all walks of life and may even include family members. But if you do see someone, if you see some signs that you believe are traffic, I'd like to, to spread the word that, that the APD Human Trafficking Unit is here not only to investigate trafficking crimes, but to, to rescue victims of trafficking and, and uh, set them on a course for recovery and for help. And, and we can do that through our partners and the partner organizations that are here with me on this panel to, to talk. Um, I do want to say that uh, if you do witness what you believe is trafficking and it's an emergent situation, uh, I'd, I'd suggest you do not intervene yourself. A lot of times um, that can uh, cause the traffic victim to be assaulted or, or you to be assaulted. Uh, the, what I suggest is to call 911. So the trafficking uh, hotlines and the human trafficking hotlines are great information sharing. But if it's an emergent problem that you think is an emergency, I suggest calling 911. Um, the majority of our cases that are worked come from our patrol units and, and they're all trained to recognize and to, to uh, coordinate the initial crime scene and contact us. Human Trafficking Unit has someone on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to respond to, to any uh, calls of human trafficking, whether it be a hotel room or a hospital, um, we can respond any time or day or night. But, but uh, as the public, I, I ask that you do not intervene and to call 911. We'll get human trafficking unit involved in the investigation and all of my detectives are trained and have contacts with all of the uh, outreach organizations that are represented here. And that's about all I have for an opening. I'll leave it to uh, Holly next. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Sergeant Spears and, um, and everyone on the panel. I'm really honored to be with you guys. and. Um, and as Sergeant Spears mentioned, um, trafficking is not an over there problem. It's a here problem and it's a now problem. Um, I'm a survivor myself. I came out of that life, uh, it'll be 20 years ago in February. And just as Sergeant Spears mentioned, I fit the profile in every way. Um, there was some abuse in my childhood and in, in my home growing up. And, um, and I, uh, rather than running away physically, ran away to drugs and alcohol and, uh, and then met my trafficker as a teenager and uh, was vulnerable to a trafficking situation because of that abuse I'd experienced in my childhood and that addiction. Um, in, in the work I do today, I find that there, are, there often is a link between trafficking, violence, and addiction. Uh, uh, the vast majority of the women we work with, we've found have violence in their, in their past, in their history, in their childhood. And, um, and got comfortable with violence in that situation and, uh, and then have turned to an addiction either before they met their trafficker or oftentimes during the trafficking situation. Um, so I, I run a nonprofit organization here in Austin called Sanctuary Project and we are specifically focused on providing employment and empowerment to women coming out of trafficking, violence, and addiction. Over the last three years, uh, we started in February of 2018, and over the last three years, we've uh, employed 28 survivors and advocated for five others and provided more than 12,000 hours of employment to women here in Austin. Um, because we get to see specifically what this issue looks like in Central Texas and in Austin, um, I can just give you today a unique lens into what it's like on the ground for survivors here and, um, and for nonprofits who are doing the work of restoration here. So Sanctuary Project often meets the, the women we work with in Travis County Jail. Um, just as Sergeant Spears was talking about working in organized crime, a lot of the work we're doing is actually more on the street level. It's more uh, girls who've been arrested often for drug charges or prostitution charges. And then I'm able to meet with them in the jail and actually identify that this is a trafficking survivor and that there, there's a trafficking case. Um, sometimes they're not even being identified as trafficking survivors before they get to Travis County uh, because uh, oftentimes a trafficking survivor is not going to self-identify. It actually took me almost 10 years to realize that my situation was trafficking because I thought he was my boyfriend and I thought he was helping me out. And so just like Sergeant Spears talked about, these relationships are so manipulative and so coercive 
that I actually thought, you know, this is my boyfriend. He loves me. He's taking care of me. I'm taking care of him. And me doing what he's asking of me is the best way forward, um, given my, my circumstances and my situation. And so as I share my story in Travis County Jail, um, oftentimes girls are coming to me and identifying as trafficking survivors that may not be caught um, by, uh, by Sergeant Spears and the wonderful work they're doing in the Organized Crime Division. And so at that point, we're able to advocate for them, um, help them to get into safe houses or recovery communities, um, and then hopefully start to work with Sanctuary Project. I, uh, I believe that um, women need to rebuild and, and young girls need to rebuild their sense of identity and self-worth and value. And I think one of the best ways to do that is through employment. Um, because employment has been linked to something so exploitive and um, in, in a lot of ways humiliating, taking that same, uh, that same area, employment, and, and uh, using it for good can be uh, just vital in their transformation and their recovery. And we've seen that in, uh, in our work at Sanctuary Project. Um, so I think one of the, the biggest things um, I've noticed is a lot of us are working in isolation right now. And so I'm really excited about this panel and about the people that are on this panel, because the more we can work together as law enforcement and, uh, and, and policymakers and NGOs, uh, the more we're going to see just a holistic approach to healing in this city, which is really exciting. Um, I think we all want to see lasting change in this area. Um, one of the greatest needs we have and see in terms of care is um, we need more beds in Austin. Um, I know Allison is working with CARES um, at Safe Alliance, which is, uh, which is a wonderful program, but I think for, uh, I don't know if you guys would all agree with this, but, um, but in my experience, finding beds and, um, and getting, getting women into lasting long-term care facilities when they're coming out of this situation, especially adults um, and, and young adults, uh, is the biggest need that, that I see right now for the NGOs. Um, so that's uh, a little bit of our work and, and our story. Um, I'm going to pass it on now to Rebecca Schmidt-Portnoy, who works with Refugee Services of Texas, and she'll probably be able to give a different lens on, on this from the work she does. Thanks for that introduction, Holly. Um, my name's Erica Schmidt-Portnoy. I am the Senior Programs Director at Refugee Services of Texas, or RST. We are a victim service provider for survivors of trafficking and victims of other crimes. Those other crimes may include sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, wage theft, the list goes on. But our Survivors of Trafficking Empowerment Program, or STEP, is designed to help survivors of trafficking through their transition to stable, independent lives. RST serves all survivors of trafficking, so labor and sex trafficking, adults and minors, foreign born and domestic born. For us at RST, our referrals come in through various ways, but we always, always encourage the community to call the National Human Trafficking Hotline if you or someone you know has been a victim of trafficking. The National Human Trafficking Hotline number is 1-888. 373-7888, and you can also text them at 233-733. But that's always the best way to reach out unless, as, uh, as Sergeant Spears said, it is an emergency. We at RST, we understand the movement of victims. Victims can be moved by their traffickers or for safety reasons, victims can move themselves or law enforcement can, can recommend that they move. And because RST is statewide and we have offices in, in six different cities, we are fortunate enough to be able to provide that continued um, support to victims, regardless of if they move to another city. This improves engagement with victims. They don't have to learn to trust yet another agency, uh, and it aids law enforcement with multi-city investigations or if they're just trying to, um, to reach uh, a, a victim in a case. Uh, RST can quickly become that one constant in a victim's life. Leave, with that said, leaving a trafficking situation can be incredibly difficult to do. And that is why RST case managers and staff are trained. They are ready to meet a survivor wherever she or he is in their journey. Uh, and when, when a survivor is referred or context, contacts RST directly, which happens more often than um, 
than, than you would think. Um, our team is assessing those basic needs first. Uh, once immediate safety and basic needs have been addressed, um, we are working through a holistic approach to support that journey towards and through recovery. Uh, and so we are conducting human trafficking screenings. We are on call 24 seven uh, and provide a crisis uh, intervention response. Uh, we support then with basic needs assistance that may include and does include medical attention at times, employment assistance, um, including getting um, getting back into the formal workforce, which Holly was speaking to a little bit. Um, we also provide counseling and therapy, therapy on site uh, at RST victim advocacy uh, to navigate the various systems, which there are so many systems, unfortunately, that victims um, often have to go through, uh, including the criminal justice system. And emotional support is a big part of providing um, services at, at RST. Case management and em emotional support are probably the two, um, two biggest things that we are, are providing. And for foreign born uh, victims, we are also um, working with them on family reunification. So often victims who are foreign born have been um, have been separated from their family, their direct family for years. Uh, and and there are uh, there are opportunities to reunify, which is which is we're thankful for. Uh, but none of this work would really be possible without partnerships. They are vital to our work. We cannot work in a silo. And law enforcement is really at the top of that list. APD has has been committed to Indian trafficking in Travis County since our RST and APD worked um, the first identified trafficking case in 2003. Um, so it's almost 20 years at this point, um, which really demonstrates, I think, the commitment um, from from this community to combat trafficking. Um, the department collaborates with service providers like RST and others on the uh, in the conference today to really ensure that whether they are single victims that are identified or victims from large scale operations, that they are connected to victim service providers, whether there is a need for shelter, support services, case management, whatever it may be. Um, and all of which are really going to help victims transition to stable, independent lives and become thriving survivors. Uh, strong community support from donors and volunteers also is, uh, is what allows RST to provide victim services support to well over 200 survivors a year. And that, uh, to, as a breakdown, that really means around 18 victims are connected to RST every month in Austin. Uh, around 25% of those are minors, 80% are women and girls, 11% um, uh, are self-referrals, so those are victims and survivors reaching out for support themselves. Over 50% are Hispanic and around 35% are labor trafficking victims. Um, so we always often, um, and it's important to, to talk about sex trafficking, there is a, a, a lot and a significant amount of labor trafficking that occurs in our community as well. Um, so we really couldn't do what we do at RST without APD and the community support. Um, we thank you for your help in combating trafficking. And if you want to get involved um, after today, please check out our website. Um, we are at uh, rstx.org. And next up, we have Monica Charles, who I am honored to introduce. Um, Monica receives services from RST through our Survivors of Trafficking Empowerment Program. She is inspiring. And Monica, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Erica. It's truly an honor to uh, be a part of this event. Um, and as um, Erica was stating, yes, I did receive services through Austin Refugee Services. And I can um, identify with what Holly was saying, right? Because I'm, I'm now 48. And um, how I actually got into um, uh, the human trafficking situation was I was in active addiction. And so I, you know, did what most addicts do and which is, you know, I needed a way to uh, fund and support my addiction. And so that led me to um, to 
um, places that I never thought I would go. And I met a man who decided, who said he was my boyfriend and said that he loved me, moved me into his house um, somewhere in East Austin, right? Um, in a middle-class neighborhood, you know, kids played in the street that we lived on. Um, and before long, he told me that um, I also needed to um, provide services to other men out of our home which was very confusing to me because I just didn't understand, you know, I thought that we were, he loved me and we were in a committed relationship. Um, and so daily life for me, that's what that consisted of, you know, um, was he went to work outside of the home and I went to work inside of the home and men were coming in and out of our house daily and how, um, neighbors weren't, weren't, um, didn't notice it, um, I'm not sure uh, because, it, it, like I said, it was in a normal middle class Austin neighborhood, right? And that's what my life consisted of four or five men coming into the home each day. Um, and uh, what motivated me to escape was he threw me out because I decided I just didn't want to do that anymore. But before, prior to me leaving, you know, he made sure to let me know that that was my life and that was always going to be my life. So I ended up in another situation. So it not only happened once to me, it happened twice. And I still wasn't really sure that it happened because um, I thought that I was supposed to live my life. And, and you know, as a Hispanic woman, we, we um, serve our men and we do as we're told and we don't, we don't, we don't ask questions, right? So I, I just believe that that was my role was to do whatever he needed me to do so that I could live in the house and I could have money to feed myself and clothe myself. And when he allowed me to, I, he would give me money, but most of the time not that went towards the home. So when I, you know, was just at the end of my rope, I, I opened my mouth and said, I didn't want to do this anymore. And I will say that, um, Austin police department did, I think when I did call the police once the police were called. Um, however, somehow I ended up in jail that night because I was trying to end my life because it was, it, the abuse was so bad. And uh, when they come out, you know, um, PES does come out and I was, you know, the victim and then felt like I was a threat to myself and others. So I, I got taken away, but something, I, I either screamed something or said something because APD did come back and offer services. I just was scared and unwilling to open my mouth. And honestly, I just, I wasn't even aware of what trafficking was. And I thought that was my role. And plus I was in active addiction at the time. So didn't really think that, you know, there was a way out. And so when he kicked me out, he kicked me out into another place and I went on to do the same thing. And then again, I met another man who became my boyfriend and supported me and my lifestyle um, and my addiction and kept me, um, kept me clothed, kept me in the home, kept, you know, provided me money for, for the drugs that I needed. And the more I used, the more that, that I became enslaved to that addiction. Right. Um, I didn't think that there would ever be a way out. Um, and I think that the final straw for me was, um, I was using so much that I wanted to end my life. And I actually just cried out to God and said, can you either kill me or can you help me? And God heard my prayer, right? Like he heard my prayer and I got out. Um, I co contacted APD again and, and just asked for help because the man who was holding me at that point was married and his wife found out and she came and, and, and threatened me and threatened him. And that's when APD stepped up and they offered, you know, they gave me the little pink pamphlet, right? And so I called the resources and I did, I ended up at um, Austin refugee services and with so much guilt and so much shame and not even realizing what had happened to me because both men were my boyfriends, right? They, both men told me that they loved me. Both men told me that they were going to take care of me and that I would never be without. And as long as I was in active addiction, I really didn't care um, what, what my life was. And I thought that was always going to be my life. Um, but you know, once the, the man's wife found out he was done with me. And so I, I learned that I wasn't, you know, who he told me I was, and I learned that I wasn't going to marry him. And then it wasn't until I went to Austin refugee services and they said, you know, if that something had happened to me and I'm like, well, there's no way that that happened to me. Cause I, 
I deserved it, right? I, I was, you know, a slave to the disease of addiction. Um, and so I was just willing to do whatever it took. And that moment of clarity came for me when I just, I couldn't use enough substances to end the pain and I couldn't end my life. Um, and so I went to them, I started attending 12 step meetings, right? And little by little, um, I found a way out. I got in, introduced through um, to another agency, which is called the Key to Free in Georgetown, Texas. Um, they put me in a safe home and I have been there um, with that agency since, since I left um, the situation that I was in. Uh, January 22nd, uh, 2019 was the day I stopped using substances and the day I stopped selling myself, right? Um, and so I'm very fortunate and I'm very grateful. Um, and it is only by God's grace and mercy that, that I was able to get out and speak up about what happened because it brought me a lot of shame. And um, it's not what you think. I thought, you know, I'm, an, I'm a grown woman. I'm an adult woman. How can this be happening to me? Because usually when you think of trafficking, you think of, you know, small children being um, taken out of their homes. Um, and again, I I was living the life of a prostitute selling myself. So I believe that 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 was something that I deserved. Um, but again, both places where I lived were in, one was in South Austin, the second was in South Austin, um, small apartment community. And again, people saw men coming in and out daily. And then finally they just saw one man and I never came out. I never came out of hiding because um, I was in hiding. So um, I guess what I want to bring awareness to is to the adult women, right? Um, and if you see something, say something. Um, if you see a woman that's hiding and doesn't speak and never comes out and you see men in and out of, of her home, you know, it's a, probably a good indication that something bad is happening there. Knock on the door, ask her if she's okay. Ask her if she's hungry, um, you know, say something. Cause it does happen. Cause it happened to me and I didn't want to admit that it happened, but it did. And I never believed that I would find a way out. But, you know, um, like I said, God, God saved me and I'm not confused about that. And I know I'm alive today because of God's love, grace, and mercy. I got out. I am now employed. Um, I, I work with other addicts. Um, I'm also going to school. I'm pursuing my social work degree. And I hope to bring awareness and to help other women. Um, and soon I'll have my own place, right? I'm still, you know, in the safe house that the Key to Free has helped provide for me. And they've given me counseling. And they've helped me to realize that it wasn't my fault and I didn't deserve it. I'm also free from um, methamphetamine in um, the two weeks, in a week and a half. So I've got two years of um, being clean and free, not only from the, the drugs, but also from the lifestyle. So I hope to any woman and, and child or, or young lady that is seeing this, that may see this, um, call 911, call um, Austin Refugee Services, call Safe Alliance. I made all those calls. Keep calling until somebody hears you because I made those calls. Um, it was difficult to navigate through through the system for me, um, but they, they persistence, right? I even called the National Trafficking Hotline. I did not stop because I wanted, I wanted out and I got out and I never ever believed that I would be able to get out. So if I can get out, I know that you can too. There is hope. And please don't think that, that God doesn't love you because he does. If he can love me, I know for a fact that he loves you. Um, and that's just my story, right? Um, that's where I came from, but that's not where I have to ever go back again. And I know that I was saved so that I could speak up and bring awareness to the young women, to the older women such as myself, um, and, and maybe offer just a little bit of hope and don't be afraid, don't be silent, speak up because I'm here um, to tell you that there is a way out. And I hope that this can help somebody. Um, and again, it's such an honor and such a privilege to be able to be here and speak my truth. And thank you for asking me um, to do that. And so with that, I'll pass it over to Allison, who you know I've I've had the pleasure of speaking with um, prior to this, and hopefully we'll get to do that again after this. 
So thank you so much, Allison. Thank you for your vulnerability, Monica. I so appreciate it. I value that so much. I'm so grateful for today. Uh, I too um, am a service provider, direct services here in Austin. And I'm also a survivor of trafficking. And today's a really important day. And I'm really grateful for everyone that's participating in this um, and encourage all of you that um, there's room for everybody in this fight. Uh, and it will take all of us to join it to really make a dent in human trafficking. Um, it is one of the most um, egregious, um, disp disproportionate um, arms against um, individuals in our in our community, and it is definitely in our backyard. It's not something that um, is happening over there. You know, we often look at news and you see um, you know things that are happening in in um, you know, Thailand or other places, and it is um, fueling um, our ability to not look at the problem and the issue that's really happening here in, in Travis County and the surrounding areas. Um, and it's important, right? Because we have, um, we have kids in our community that um, could be at risk of being trafficked. Um, and it's, it's definitely the most egregious violation against humanity. I know that every dollar uh, made is at the cost of complete degradation of human dignity. It's a, a highly complex issue, right? It can happen to any race, any gender, any ethnicity or social economic, back, uh, economic background. So it's not a black issue or a um, poor issue. This, this can happen to everyone. Um, outside of being a survivor, I do um, serve as the program director for CARES at Safe Alliance. So we serve trafficked youth age 12 to 24. Um, but I do other work outside of that as well. I've worked in policy. I created my own legislation last session um, in Texas Ledge. I train law enforcement and healthcare professionals, um, prosecutors across the U.S., and also um, do technical assistance and training for human trafficking courts across the U.S. and and others. But with that being said, um, you know, despite it being um, a global crisis, there are common tra tragic threats, especially here in the U.S and tracking disproportionately affects women and girls and women and girls of color. Um, tracking preys and exploits people on their vulnerabilities. Um, and so there are many forms, it looks a lot of different ways. And sadly, our anti-trafficking movement is poorly, poorly branded this. I think someone already mentioned this, that we're always looking for that pretty young white girl that's beat up and tied up. Because if you look up human trafficking online, that's what you'll see. Um, and the reality is um, they're hidden in plain sight because of that, right? We're not seeing them in our own communities. Um, and, it, and it also feels um, misconceptions about traffickers. So you might be looking for Snoop Dogg or um, Ice-T or someone like that, but you're missing the guy in the suit by the caramel macchiato in front of you at Starbucks. Um, but it's extremely prevalent. Um, and sadly, oftentimes the victims are re-victimized by the very institutions that are meant to, to help and protect them. I was one of those individuals, um, but minors and adults face similar uh, vulnerabilities. And um, generally, it's a history of childhood sexual abuse. That's really where my story begins is childhood sexual abuse. It could be homelessness. Uh, I ran away at 11 or 12, found myself uh, homeless in Houston, Texas with no food, no clothes, no place to sleep. Um, started engaging in survival sex to get my needs met. So a lot of our clients and a lot of individuals uh, are prey to traffickers, right? Uh, it's a vulnerability. Um, to be in those situations, but our foster care and juvenile justice involvement, um, poverty and, and all those two definitely add to um, those risk factors. And I think too that um, it's important to note that um, despite individuals working in the sex trade, it is it, it qualifies as a vulnerability, right? Um, so there's numerous factors uh, at individual community and system levels that contribute to the prevalence of sex trafficking. Um, labor trafficking by far is the highest amount of victimization in, in the trafficking realm in the state of Texas. And we need to spend more time um, talking about that, raising awareness and creating innovative solutions towards that. Um, so funding is always an issue. I encourage you, if you have time or if you have money, uh, donate one or the other um, or both. Uh, but we always are running scares on resources. Um, and it takes, you know, a comprehensive approach to reach across a multitude of demographics, right? And and um, it, it's definitely gonna take all of us to invest in this fight. So I think Texas is, um, I think last that I read in 2019, it ranks as um, one of the five highest states uh, with sex trafficking activity. And um, I think it was human trafficking hotline that related uh, 2,720 trafficking related calls from Texas 
and out of that, a hundred, one thousand, over a thousand cases of trafficking were reported. And so of those, 111 were labor trafficking, and we're just not talking about that enough. Um, but there are few comprehensive uh, programs for survivors of trafficking in Austin and Central Texas, and even fewer like SAFE, the organization that I work for, because we offer integrated services for survivors, including emergency shelter, transitional housing, counseling, um, forensic nursing, advocacy, peer support, legal services, and, and much more. Um, but we can't do that without all our partners. Amazing partners like RSC, we get to partner with every day on the front lines, and um, that's really where uh, where, we, where the rubber meets the ground, right? Is through collaboration. And so our um, our programs just it's utilized to uh, be gender specific. So we serve all genders, um, all races, all ethnicities, all. Um, uh, it doesn't matter. We just meet you right where you're at. Uh, we're trauma focused, strength based, um, and client driven, and we. Um, we definitely are survivor led and survivor driven. So um, myself, I was also an addict, right? Uh, due to the childhood sexual abuse. And uh, as a young adult, I found myself in a, in a um, very dangerous situation where I was um, actively um, prostituting and in the life with my addiction. And I became targeted by gang members. Um, they would be ordered to kidnap me and uh, forced me to prostitute and, and unspeakable things. And I would run and they would find me. And eventually my real trafficker showed up as my knight in shining armor. Um, and he pretended to rescue me and save me, told me he could keep me safe. And um, I, what I didn't realize is at that very moment, I was already being groomed and um, that, the, that it had already started, right? And so I actually was with my, my trafficker for nearly a decade. And um, the other common tragic thread that I often work in is uh, victim offender overlap. So not only was I groomed and, um, and trained to be his property and prostitute, but I was also groomed and trained to uh, purchase all his drugs, sell all his drugs, take the penitentiary risk for his drugs, as well as other uh, organized crime um, issues, which I won't say I didn't get caught for them all. I want to go home today. Uh, but yeah, so that is a huge, huge issue that we often see with our survivors. Um, I think according to one research, 90% uh, of survivors have reported being arrested and at least half of those more than nine times. And so that's a, an issue that we work on very diligently. Um, so instead I cycled, I was never extracted, I was never rescued, I was never identified. Um, if I was identified, it was as something else, domestic violence um, or a drug addict or uh, any, any of those misconceptions and preconceptions and biases we bring into this space. Um, often inhibited me from being uh, identified. Instead, I cycled in and out of our prison system. So I went to prison five times, been over 10 years collectively behind bars. And I'm nearly, I had, I have eight felonies. My ninth was the last one, but I actually got ex services for the first time that actually helped me get out of the life. Um, imagine if I had had that on the front end instead of the back end. Um, but all those felonies really all were incurable under the oppression of my trafficker. So with that being said, um, there's still a lot of work to do and we need your help. And um, I encourage you to um, reach out to us, right? Reach out and see how you can get involved, get, how you can get um, connected with uh, advocacy agencies. And, and we work on a comprehensive approach from uh, the tracking continuum. So that's from prevention to recovery and beyond. And there's definitely room for all of you in this fight. That's all I have. Thank you, Allison. We really appreciate your message. Um, lastly, we'll uh, have Tiffany, Tiffany Lee, uh, who's the partnership manager with Allies Against Slavery. Uh, she'll uh, be bringing us her message. Uh, Tiffany, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you, Allison, to everyone else on this call. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. It is such an honor to be here with each of you. Um, so, like you said, my name is Tiffany Lee. I'm the partnership manager for Allies Against Slavery. And as you've been hearing today, you know, human trafficking is a crime that involves the exploitation of men, women, and children for forced labor or forced sex by a third party for their own profit or gain. And this crime does occur across all types of communities and affects victims across the state of Texas, including right here in Austin. And Allies Against Slavery is a nonprofit organization based here in Austin. And our mission is to end human trafficking and to protect freedom and dignity. Allies has worked in this space for over a decade and co-leads the Central Texas Coalition Against Human Trafficking, 
which is a regional network of over 65 agencies dedicated to providing comprehensive services to survivors. Refugee Services of Texas and SAFE, who've both spoken here today, are two of those partners that we work with through both the coalition and through our platform called Lighthouse. Um, Lighthouse is a powerful software tool that helps professionals and organizations identify victims of trafficking, coordinate care, and gain valuable insights on data trends. There are over 75 sites and more than 600 professionals across Texas who are currently using Lighthouse, and they have conducted more than 2,400 screenings of over 2,000 individuals since May of last year. Lighthouse has integrated a screening tool called See It that's been used since 2016 across the state of Texas. And overall, nearly 35,000 screenings have been completed with over 4,400 individual screenings or about 13% showing a clear concern for sex trafficking. So I just wanna reiterate you know, what others have said today, You know, whether you are a professional who may encounter a survivor or you're just a member of the Austin community, every person does play a crucial role in eradicating human trafficking. You can learn more about the issue by visiting our website at alliesagainstslavery.org. Um, there you can also learn more about Allies and Lighthouse and how you can support us doing this important work. You can also reach out to us anytime at info at alliesagainstslavery.org. And I thank you again so much for including me today and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, next, we'll pass it over to our pool reporter, Luis Acosta with Univision uh, for uh, some questions from our speakers. Luis? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna start with this question. What is the percentage of Hispanics affected by human trafficking in Texas? And what recommendations do you give people who may be, be undocumented and may be scared to report cases? I can start with that, uh, Luis. It's a great question. I, for for us, you know, the the numbers that I provided earlier were Austin specific, but we are statewide. And for us statewide, we um, we see around sixty seven percent of the of the individuals that are referred for our services as being Hispanic or Latino. So very high and certainly depending on where you're at in in uh in texas it's a it's the dominant um demographic for for victims um i think for those who are undocumented um that is a legitimate fear um and something that we really have to combat within the community um that when you do make an outcry and you are undocumented you're not going to be um, you're not going to be uh, face the re you know any repercussions because of your immigration status. Um, trafficking is not a um, it's it's it, it, nobody should be trafficked. It doesn't matter what your immigration status is, and I think we can all uh, agree on that. However, out in the community, we still have a lot of education to do around that, right? So that if you do make an outcry to um, your school teacher, that he or she will believe the same um, and help connect you to services. So um, it, it, it is a human right that that nobody should be. Um, experiencing these these things and so we have to act as a and respond as a community to make it very clear that it does we we are not looking at your immigration status um, when you tell us that you have been trafficked or that you have been exploited what we are concerned about and what we want to respond to is that exploitation that you have experienced in your life um, and it takes all of us to message that very clearly um, nonprofits law enforcement legal providers um, um, everyone and so I would absolutely encourage um, uh, you know people to to reach out despite that immigration status um, we at RST we are also happy to um, do messaging around that um, and and specifically to the Spanish speaking community and um, the foreign born you know community in general which is large in in Texas um, we want the same protections in place for whether you're domestic born or foreign born. Um, I hope that answers the question. I'd like to uh, follow up Christian on that one. I, I can speak for the Austin Police Department and the Austin Police Human Trafficking Unit. And um, 
status as a as whether you're documented or not is not a an issue at all for us. It, it won't even be asked. So we're not going to ask if you're if you're uh, reporting a, as a victim. We're not going to ask the suspects. Anyone involved, their their documented status will not be an issue at all. I think I want to attack team on this as well. I think uh, last session when I was pulling data for um, legislation, I think with um, this this community or this population that oops, sorry y'all, that um, it's important to note that that oftentimes as far as a state, um, our our way to track information, right? A lot of um, agencies or um, or um, systems might say white and non-white. Right, so we don't really know the exact numbers. We don't know um, who all is being impacted when we're counting um, and measuring that. So I think that's that's important to note that we we all come together and decide on what what that looks like, right? Um, so that we have a better understanding. Right. Thank you. Uh, my next question is: What community is the most vulnerable for human trafficking, and why? I'll go ahead and take this um, just because I, I think you heard a common thread today in the three survivors who shared our stories. Um, one of the areas that's often overlooked is those who have been victims of sexual violence as children and those who struggle with addiction. Um, and, you know, if you if you heard that's a, that was, I think, a common thread in all three of our stories. And so I think there may be a, a justification in getting together with some of the child protective services in Austin just to make sure we're um, that those children who are being identified as sexual violence survivors, that resources come into place to help protect them from future exploitation and trafficking. Um, I would say the same with drug enforcement, uh, that you know, law enforcement that's dealing with addicts and and with um, with with drug charges to maybe be asking those questions about what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, for a lot of female addicts, we become especially vulnerable to trafficking um, because it's a it's a very male dominated area, and and women tend to um, just like Allison's case end up being the ones to take the fall when really the trafficker is um, is the one to blame. Um, so there are at, in Travis County Jail, the majority of the of the women I work with who've been trafficked and who are identifying in Travis County Jail are actually there for drug charges, and oftentimes those drug charges were as a result of their trafficker. So the traffickers asking them to carry the drugs for them, the traffickers asking them to move the drugs for them, and then they're also trafficking them. Um, so basically these women are vulnerable from every area. Um, so I would say that those are some of the more um, the more common things we see specific to Austin, um, but I'll let others speak into that as well. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, one of the top community segments that I see, and I've been doing this work um, since I exited life in 2011, would be um, our our runaway and homeless population, right? Um, as well as um, our juvenile justice system. So there's a huge link uh, with that, and also our child welfare system. And then if your dual system involved, uh, the outcomes are even you know more more um, prevalent. I think within all of those those different systems and vulnerabilities, I think it's really critical for the community to be ensuring that we've got language access available, um, right? So many um, many minors uh, who have been trafficked are American born, but have parents who um, who are not and may be speakers of another language, right? So there's not a language barrier for the minor victim himself or herself, but there is with the family. And I think to respond fully to this issue, you've got to look at the family system as a whole. And um, and that's that's come up throughout this, um, this meeting this morning, um, but certainly to be able to respond um, well to those parents and, and work with those parents, we need to make sure we've got language access available and readily available um, so that that doesn't become a reason why parents don't engage in services also. Um, it's really incredibly difficult to have um, your child experiencing this, right? And so you want to make it as um, as easy as possible and as supportive as possible for those parents um, who are going through this as well, I would say. Thank you. Uh, my next question is, 
Uh, is there a way or how do authorities identify runaway teens that might be at risk of human trafficking? Um, I'll start with that. Um, again, we at the Human Trafficking Unit, we've recently uh, employed a, a new policy to, to identify runaways that are, that are very uh, prone to trafficking. And so if they run away multiple times, on their third time recovered, they're they're put into a system where they they are uh, we we align them with with a safe cares program and other outreach programs to to at least counsel them on the on the dangers of trafficking. And I'll, I'll let I'll let the the uh, the other panelists talk about that. But we have flags in our system now, and uh, that show if you're a multiple time runaway, that being one of the major trafficking signs. That, that you'll be flagged and it'll automatically prompt a, uh, a case worker to come and speak with them. And, and I'll leave it with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually we partner with RST on this as well. Um, but as a runaway uh, myself, I can assure you that any runaway is at risk of being trafficked. Um, not only are they being targeted by predators um, and uh, buyers, individuals buying children, but also traffickers as well. Um, I think the uh, research kind of varies how many hours it takes before a child is approached, um, depending on what you look like, uh, what, what research you look at or the numbers you look at. But um, it's definitely within the first, you know, 72 hours. That's why it's so critical to recover so quickly. Um, but yes, thanks to the foresight of, of, of APD and, and partnering with um, RST, we have um, created policy and procedures to engage um, individuals that have run away at least three times or more. And so we have wrapped that into our statewide response as far as care coordination, and we're, we're ironing out the fine details on that, but um, definitely they will be connected to services. All right, thank you. And as a follow-up question as well is, what are some key signs that other individuals can spot someone that may be a victim of human trafficking? I think this is super important because as um, I think Holly had mentioned um, herself, like I didn't identify myself as a victim, right? That wasn't my trafficker, that was my pimp. He, he loved, I mean, that was my boyfriend, he loved me. Um, and that's, that's, that makes our job all the more important, right, um, is that uh, we need to know those signs and efforts to um, potentially identify a victim. But also it can be dangerous, right, if you're just relying on those signs. They're helpful, but they're not the best to just use as your only tool in your toolbox because um, then you're missing the ones that don't fit that, right? So trafficking looks different in a law enforcement situation. It looks different in a healthcare situation. It looks different in a school. It looks different everywhere. Um, and so just to really understand the nuances, but definitely, um, you know, sudden isolation. They're not hanging out with their friends and family like they used to anymore. Uh, sudden change in appearance, like dress and clothing. Um, maybe the clothing is not appropriate um, for, you know, the occasion or the weather. Um, definite, I see definitely um, with every single survivor I work with, the inability to make eye contact um, is a big, big issue. Um, definite signs of anxiety, um, not able to come and go as they please. Um, numerous signs, um, maybe two cell phones, or maybe they have like a really expensive purse or nails, but they don't have any money. Um, those can be def definite key indicators. And I think for um, just to to add on to that that comprehensive list that Allison was just providing, you know, for um, for foreign born victims, you know, if they have had their identification documents taken away, um, that should never be a stipulation for employment anywhere. Um, you know, and are they free to come and go right from their work situation, um, forced to do something they didn't want to do? Uh, you know, at having to ask for permission to eat, sleep, or use the bathroom um, at their workplace, those kinds of things um, are not um, are not allowed under labor laws in the U.S. And so those are, are easy, easier um, ways to identify, at least on the labor side of things. Yeah. I'd also like to touch on that if I could, because um, like Allison said, um, you know, um, there was a lot of activity going on in my home, but I never left the home, right? 
um, I was a hundred pounds and I, and I would never look people in the eye if people came over. Um, and the, my boyfriend, right, would come and go as he pleased. I never left. So, and our neighbors knew, I think they knew I lived in the house. They definitely knew he lived in the house. Um, broad daylight every day, Monday through Sunday, all hours of the day, um, men, five or six, seven, eight, sometimes 10 men coming into the home for about 30 minutes to an hour and then leaving. And then another man would come for about 30 minutes and an hour and then he would leave. Um, and again, kids were playing in the street, neighbors were watering their lawns, mowing their lawns, the mail was being delivered, packages were, I mean, life around me went on like I just, I thought everyone saw it and knew it and it was okay. So if nobody was going to say anything, why would I? But that is really, um, and now that I am where I am, I'm able to, to recognize that. If you see a lot of activity at someone's, at a couple's home or just at a woman's home, and you don't understand why people, men are coming in and out of this house all day, every day for about an hour, please, you know, like I said, knock on the door, call, call law enforcement, 911. Regardless of what the illegal activity is, something's not going on right there. And I'm sure, you know, Mike could, can agree with me, right? If somebody calls you and said, hey, there's a lot of activity at this house. I don't know what it is, but maybe you need to check it out. And at the very least, you know, you might help some, you might help some, save someone's life. So, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. I agree with you. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I can't, you know, I can't tell you what a wealth of information and, and experience we have on this panel. And I, I can just sit back and listen to you ladies all day long. Um, again, most of our tips come in through through uh, patrol, but also through through neighbors. You know, they, they will either think it's an emergency and call 911, which I suggest, or, or if they think it's not an emergency, you can call these tip lines, email the tip lines, text them, and, and probably half of our cases come from these tip lines. I'll assign them to my detectives and we'll, we'll, we'll investigate. We'll, we'll do surveillance at, at we'll, we take every tip very seriously because as I've learned in 28 years of law enforcement, some the, the things you, you hear, you think cannot absolutely cannot be true. Those are the things that are true. And, and, and if it saves just one victim by going to 400 different houses in a year, it's worth it. And, and uh, that's, that's what our goal is. So, so I can't thank all of you panelists enough. With your experience, I'm learning something every day just talking to you. So thank you. Well, I'd also like to say there's no um, there's no model for the you know the man that's coming into that house. Um, there were doctors, lawyers, teachers. Um, so just because he he doesn't look like he's got tattoos all over him or he you know he drives a nice car, right? He looks just like your neighbor, he looks like the person sitting next to you in church, um, you know, next to you at wherever, at the grocery store. He doesn't look like what you think he would look like. And that's what I think was very frightening to me um, is that the men that were coming over weren't who you thought they would be. Um, somebody's father, somebody's brother, somebody's teacher, somebody's um, attorney, somebody's doctor. Um, that's um, something to be um, concerned about for me. And all the more reason to yes. and the chance and make it a priority in our yes. city. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes. We have to, in efforts really in, in uh, human trafficking, we have to fight demand. We have to fight yes. the demand, period. Yes. yes, yes, I agree. Thank you. Thank you uh, for those responses. Uh, and I know several statistics were shared throughout the press conference, but we wanted to ask, uh, are there any other statistics you can share about teens who fall victims of human trafficking? I could provide it afterwards, probably not on the spot. <laughs> I'd have to dig for it. Yeah, yeah, um, Jan, I'm sorry. Someone else oh, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, I was going to say there there was a study that was conducted um, by UT and our organization partnered with them, and I'd be happy to provide that link. And it um, kind oh, of goes through some of the um, lifetime statistics of people yeah. living in Texas. Actually, yeah, I do have a comment on to the public. Nothing was wrong with me. Is that the one you're talking about, Tiffany? Um, yeah, well, so there's actually two. So I can I'd be happy to provide both of those links yeah. um, to the media so that you all can share that information. Yeah, and I, there, there is an interesting where I find very telling, um, pers uh, I guess the percentage that was shared in that report that um, of sick trafficking survivor kiddos or youth or young adults in the state of Texas that are confirmed victims, um, over 70% of them had engaged in uncore survival sex prior to being trafficked. So I think that's a really important um, thing to note um, when we're talking about this, um, you know, in, in larger spaces. Thank you. And, and my last question, just to recap, I know this was spoken throughout the, the press conference as well, is what types of human trafficking can be found in the U.S. and what are the most common ones in here in Texas? I think we see it all, unfortunately, um, for better or worse, in Texas and across the country, um, there is um, far too much uh, sex and labor trafficking going on. And, and I would say for as many um, people who are identified or identify themselves as being a sex trafficking victim or a labor trafficking victim, increasingly we see victims of both forms of trafficking. And so I think um, that's always important to to highlight because we don't want to stop um, when we identify one form of trafficking and say, okay, that's it, that's where your victimization ends, kind of. Um, but there actually may be more, even you know, that has happened um, and that this uh, the person in front of you has experienced in their life. And so I think just being open to listening um, and hearing people out, uh, it's difficult. Um, it, it, it can be difficult to identify trafficking, and I think that's why we, uh, or harder maybe to identify trafficking than other crimes. And that's why we see so many survivors who, um, and and three who have graciously shared their stories today, who have, um, you know, had other records, other, other crimes on their record, right? Because easier to identify, you misidentify the community and everybody. It's a it's a cultural shift we have to make, I think, um, to push past the easy answers or um, what uh, what looks uh, to be happening um, and and actually question whether there has something has been trafficking actually happening. Um, to Aaron, somebody. Aaron, love yes. that Aaron. We don't just need a cultural shift. We need a cultural change. We need culture Thank change you. so desperately. Um, and I, I completely concur with you. And I think part of it too is right where, like for me, you saw domestic violence, but it was human trafficking, right? You saw um, a drug addict, but it was human trafficking. You saw, you know, all the all the misconceptions that we bring to the table, um, definitely in light of that, and and that intersectionality, right? So even though um, I was selling drugs from a trafficker, and I actually, you know, which wasn't for it, that's labor trafficking. It's forced criminality. That's also an intersection that we need to to look at as well. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Allison and Erica. Now that we've wrapped up the questions with Luis Acosta from Univision, we're going to wrap up and uh, conclude our press conference on Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month. Thank you to all of our speakers today. Your compassionate work is greatly admired and respected. We ask that all of our viewers stay tuned to APD's social media for additional awareness information that we plan to share throughout January. Have a great day, Austin.